I'm Francesca Tronquin, and I'm going to be talking to you from the Getty Villa in Southern California about a crater, that is to say a mixing vessel that comes from the Greek archaic period with a scene of Odysseus, great hero, escaping from the cave of Polyphemus. Can I just ask what would have been mixed in here? Mm, it's a good question and fortunately an easy one to answer. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> the Greeks would always mix their wine with water. Uh, it sounds of kind of strange to us, but Greek wine was evidently very dense and heavy. Some wines could even be mixed with honey and spices and herbs mm. and things like that. And according to the Greeks, only a barbarian would drink his wine unmixed. That would be uh. us. <laughs> yeah, that absolutely. Would be us. <laughs> Maybe we should start off with a little bit about the story. It okay. is a great story. This comes from the Odyssey of Homer, the story of Odysseus, who was on the victorious side of the Trojan War, one of the great Greek warriors who survived the Trojan War, and he wanted nothing more but to get back home to Ithaca, an island off the coast of Greece. And his wife Penelope. And his wife Penelope and, and his, his son, son Telemachus. Telemachus. Very yeah. good. But Odysseus had a lot of difficulty in finding his way home. And according to That's Homer... That's an understatement. Yeah, according to Homer, it took him about 10 years. So what we have here is just one little snippet of a scene that occurs after Odysseus and his men have spent the night in the cave of Polyphemus, a cyclops, a son of the god of the sea Poseidon. A cyclops is a giant... Yes. And known for having had one eye. Absolutely. This, so the giant had actually trapped these men in the cave the, the, with the intention. He was going to eat them. Right? Eat the, okay. And he did. He did snack on a few. Like a good barbarian, Polyphemus drank his wine unmixed and got too drunk and uh -huh. got very angry uh -huh. and started scooping up Odysseus's men and eating them like peanuts. Odysseus and the survivors developed a plan to escape from the cave. And since Polyphemus was already pretty drunk, and he was passing out, Odysseus and his men took a big, long tree trunk, put it in a fire, and sharpened the end of it, and Polyphemus passed out drunk. They gouged his eye out. Lovely. My Latin teacher loved <laughs> to talk about that. You know, as grisly as the story it is, it's very indicative of a kind of Greek way of thinking. You don't treat your house guests badly, and that is precisely <laughs> what Polyphemus had done. And so they needed to escape. So they blind Polyphemus with this giant stake. Then the next step to sneaking out of the cave was Odysseus and his men lashed themselves underneath the herd of sheep and rams that Polyphemus had. So as the sheep were walking out of the cave, Polyphemus was sort of patting the sheep on the back and he couldn't feel that the men were riding underneath. Because he was standing guard at the mouth of the cave. Yes. To make sure they didn't escape. Yes. And as Odysseus and his men, as they're leaving and about to sail away, Polyphemus says, well, the least you can do is tell me your name. And Odysseus tells him in Greek, my name is nobody. Mm -hmm. And so Polyphemus is very angry and he says, nobody has blinded me and nobody has stolen my sheep. <laughs> so the scene that we have here is really just a little snapshot of that entire story. But you have to remember that a Greek audience would immediately recognize this. One particular scene would be able to recount the entire right. story. I think there's a little extra humor here because, of course, this is painted on a vessel that's meant to serve wine. Yes. Right? And so, so it is sort of wonderfully folded into itself, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And I think on a lot of Greek vases designed for drinking wine, there are all kinds of life lessons, so to speak. And this is one of them, of course. By looking at this little snapshot of the story of Odysseus, you remember Polyphemus, and you remember not to drink too much. Okay, hopefully. So, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. 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 So how is this painted? When we think about ceramics, we think about glazes, and this looks mm -hmm. very shiny in certain places, but the Greeks didn't really have glazes in the way that we understand them. Isn't that right? No, that's absolutely right. What the Greeks used for vase painting and we use that term painting rather loosely because just the same that it wasn't really glaze, it wasn't really paint, but in fact slip, which is very watered down clay. And this gives us an insight into the tremendous difficulty of vase painting because after the potter has thrown the vase on a potter's wheel, he might paint the vase himself or he might pass it off to someone who was exclusively a painter. And in using that slip, that watered down clay and painting, 
painting on a clay vessel. It's almost like painting on a black canvas with black paint. Mm -hmm. There would have been very difficult to see a lot of the areas that had been painted. But now you can see them, so yes. what makes that visible? That happens through the magic of firing clay. And the amount of oxygen that, yes. gets, that gets into the kiln, isn't yes. that right? The Greeks very early on developed an excellent way of firing their pots like this and let air in and out of the kiln at certain times in the firing process so that all of the areas that were unpainted remained this clay-colored red, this terracotta mm -hmm. reddish-orange. And all of those places that had been painted, touched by the brush, they turned black through oxidation. And then the artist has gone in and it seems like with a little stylus of some sort has actually etched into that black. Did that happen yes. after the firing? Yes, that happened after the firing. So these details that you see, for example, of the arm of Odysseus coming around the side of the ram, of the ropes that are tying Odysseus to the ram, the ram's eye as well. Those are all incised in with, like you said, a, like a stylus. Another technique that's been used here is added color. There are big patches of white in those two big eyes that are on either side of the vessel, these eyes that have a very enigmatic meaning to us today. I don't think anyone has quite worked out exactly what those giant eyes mean. And there's also added white along the belly of the ram and for the ram's horns. Oh, yes. And, and that white was added after the firing process, and that explains why a lot of it has, flaked, has off. flaked off. I'm really interested in looking at Odysseus's face, because here he is, his men have been devoured, at least some of them. <laughs> He's really defying death by escaping, mm -hmm. and yet, as a hero, he looks so calm. Mm -hmm. He looks so beautiful, and his face looks so determined. Well, I think this is a characteristic, you could say, of Greek art from the archaic and the classical period, that the facial expressions, for the most part, are really quite blank. And there are some tremendously violent scenes. For example, you can think of the pediment of the Temple of Zeus at Olympia, where centaurs are attacking Greek women and men, yet everyone has these perfectly placid facial expressions on the it's so Parthenon. It's so curious. Why, exactly. would they, why would they do that? Is it about transcending the earth thing? Or perhaps just the nobility of calm? Your guess is as good as mine. And this is an example of black figure. Yes. Potter. Black figure, which was the earliest form of painting on vases like this one where really you're painting the positive areas, you're painting the objects that you see, the tree, the, the sheep and so forth, rather than red figure where those details, where the actual figures are reserved and the background is painted in. So this is silhouette, that a kind of, right, a kind of reserve line. Reserve. Yes. Fantastic. Terrific. Thank you so much. Sure.